Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to round 19, coverage of the Zurich 1953 Candidates Tournament. Uh, for this round, I selected the game between uh, Isaac Boleslavsky and F.M. Geller. Isaac with the white pieces and Geller... Boleslavsky with the white pieces and Geller with the black pieces. Um, this was one of those rounds where the grandmasters are looking a bit tired. After 19 rounds, I guess they were uh, <laughs> feeling a little bit tuckered out. The uh, lot of uh, a number of games were uh, draws, and then in, in some of the hard-fought games, there were some amazing blunders. There was this game uh, Zabo against uh, Ryshevsky, where Zabo had a maiden two on the board. He could have just played it, and he didn't. <laughs> and uh, I guess both of them sort of overlooked it. He still had a winning position, so maybe that's why he wasn't so concerned about getting exactly the right move. But then at the end of the game. Um, he uh, he made one bad move and gave away his advantage, and it uh, ended in a draw. So really lucky escape for Ryshevsky there. So um, this game is uh, Sicilian defense. Uh, you know, Geller playing the Sicilian and Boleslavsky attacking. There's some comment here from uh, Bronstein I'd like to read. It sets up the game nicely. Mutual forcing attacking play against opposite wing castled positions is one of the sharpest forms of the chess struggle. So, yeah, they're both going to castle on opposite sides. <laughs> In this, it is equally important not to throw oneself too hastily into the attack and not to be excessively concerned with the defense of one's own king. The harmonious blending of attack and defense based on experience, knowledge, and intuition is what we find in this game between two masters of the aggressive style. So, uh, I have this new... Um, uh, database that I got from uh, from Chessbase, the uh, the big database, and um, it came with some pictures. So um, let's find a picture here. This is um, well, this is a caricature. This is Boleslavsky. Uh, this must have been drawn when he still had hair. And then this is a picture taken in 1953. So that's uh, what he looked like at the the time of the tournament with the receding hairline, big smile. And then uh, his his opponent, F.M. Geller, was a younger player. And uh, let's see if we can find a picture from, uh, yeah, 1953. Yeah, so here's what, he, here's what he looked like at the time of the tournament, looking very serious. Here's a picture from a few years later where he's got a little bit of a smile on him. So that's uh, F.M. Geller. Um, okay, well, let's, uh, let's get into the game now. So Boleslavsky, who uh, is famous, of course, for the, uh, his line in the Sicilian, he starts off with e4, and Geller, not afraid to play the Sicilian against Boleslavsky, plays uh, c5. So we get some normal moves, knight f3, knight c6, d4, and we go for the open Sicilian. And then developing the knight. So this could be setting up either a classical Sicilian with d6 or a, um, <clears throat> a Sveshnikov with uh, e5. So knight c3, defending the pawn, and d6. So this is the classical Sicilian with the two knights. And um, Boleslavsky plays in an interesting way here. He plays g3. This is not the most common move at this point. But um, it's uh, setting up an attempt to set up a more quiet and positional system. So we'll see what happens here, <laughs> because it doesn't end up that way. Bishop to g4, attacking the queen. And now he felt forced to play... Um, the pawn to f3 he really doesn't want to bring the knight back to f3 and, and set up this uh, pin for white, uh, for black. And um, I guess the queen doesn't really have any great squares to move to at the moment. So he's uh, sort of forced to put the pawn on f3. The bishop drops back to d7. Now he continues developing bishop e3. And uh, Geller here goes for the fianchetto. And after queen d2... Bishop g7, both uh, both sides castle. So we do get the opposite side castling. White castles first on the queen side, black castles on the king side, and then uh, Geller plays the move g4. I mean, oh, Boleslavsky. Boleslavsky plays the move g4. So um, we've actually transposed from, uh, from Boleslavsky's attempt to play a quiet Sicilian into uh, one of the sharpest Sicilians available. This is the uh, Yugoslav attack against the uh, dragon. Yeah, Geller is playing the Dragon Sicilian, that's what this setup is, and Boleslavsky is playing the Yugoslav attack against it. And what happened is there were a couple extra moves inserted for each side. This pawn went from uh, g2 uh, to g3 and then to g4, so it took two moves to get there. But this bishop went from uh, c8 to, uh, 
to g4 and then back to uh, d7. So it also took two moves. So because both sides have wasted the same number of moves, are actually in a in a standard position <laughs> of the uh, the dragon. So kind of an interesting maneuver there. So the game continues. Rick c8, king b1, getting off of the c file. Knight e5. Sorry, knight e5. Good central post for the knight. And um, also putting some pressure on this f3 pawn, which is really the base of, uh, of white's setup here. Of course, both sides are going to eventually uh, pawn storm. White's getting his pawns going, and uh, black will eventually get his rolling here. He's a little bit behind. h5. And now b5, getting it going uh, right away. Um, now, it's interesting that um, Geller doesn't really even think about taking this pawn. I guess the idea here, if you take the pawn, it, it makes things a little bit easier for the black player to uh, get an attack going on the, uh, on the white king. So he doesn't, uh, doesn't pay any attention to this uh, loose pawn here, and instead plays uh, bishop to h6, going after the... Uh, the dark squared bishop here, which is uh, potentially a good piece. You'll see this this diagonal is entirely clogged at the moment, but it's not clogged with pawns. It's clogged with uh, knights, which can easily move away and uh, can quickly uh, sometimes move with tempo, and that diagonal can get opened up. So this is still a powerful piece, and uh, it's worthwhile to exchange it off. Uh, black takes, white takes, and now uh, black in this position sacrifices the exchange just out of the blue. And this is a very typical uh, motif in the Sicilian. He's just giving up the rook for that knight in order to, uh, you know, black really needs to have some counter chances. If he just sits around and tries to defend passively, um, <clears throat> uh, white is going to manage to open up the uh, h-file with the move um, h5. Uh, yeah, I think h5 could even be played here because uh, g G5 would be met by queen takes, so he would get he would get an opening over here in some somewhere or other. So uh, so uh, and Black's position is quite precarious once the H file opens up. So he really needs to get some counterplay going, and it's worthwhile to sacrifice the rook for the knight in order to get uh, the pawns messed up over here on the king side and um, and go after the uh, the C3 pawn here. Now a lot of times, if we back up for a second, in this position. Uh, it's also a move. You could have also played queen a5 first to help set up the uh, the rook sack, the exchange sack, because then you take pawn takes and then queen takes on c3 right away. But it turns out it, it works equally well in this position just to take immediately and then play the queen to a5, hitting the pawn. Now, um, white decides to hold on to the pawn. Actually, he, he needs to take care that uh, he doesn't suddenly get mated. So the queen has to come back from its aggressive post and uh, start defending. And uh, here, um, queen to a3 was played, coming in closer to the king and uh, cutting off some squares and keeping pressure on, um, on the... Uh, on the c pawn there. It was tempting a little bit to play knight c4. Knight, knight c4 is a very typical move in the Sicilian and uh, it does kind of wrench open the the g file but in this particular case knight c4 knight c4 bishop takes pawn takes this is a line given by Bronstein. The king can just dock over to the side here and then the rook if the rook comes over to the b file to attack um, it can just be opposed by this rook. So um, so um, black is just not making any progress with that move. So uh, Boleslavsky holds off on that knight c4 idea. Um, a lot of times that's played when the, the bishop is still... The move knight c4 is, is played a lot of times when the queen is still here and the bishop is still here, and it's sort of forking those two pieces. And uh, in, in those cases, it can be good. But, but in this particular spot, it's not, not the best move. So queen a3 was played. And, uh, and white continues on with uh, h5. And now the move uh, g5 to try and uh, keep things closed is just not working here because the queen can take it. So, uh, so black continues with the attack. Black continues with uh, b4. But uh, there is a very interesting possibility that was pointed out. Uh, it's not in Bronstein's book, even though he was uh, commenting on the game closely, going, going over line by line. But there's actually a tactical shot that uh, black has right here that the uh, chess engine finds. 
So if you want to uh, see if you can uh, be smarter than a, a grandmaster, <laughs> you can find the move that the engine finds that the, the grandmasters didn't. Uh, yeah, so pause the video here if you want to take some time to look for this. It's a, it's a hard to find tactic, but uh, pretty interesting. Might be worth, might be worth spending some time looking for it. Okay, I'm going to give the answer away right now. Uh, black right here can play knight takes f3. I mentioned, you know, this pawn on f3 is the basis of the whole pawn chain. And, uh, you, you know, it seems a bit extreme to sacrifice a knight after you've just sacrificed the exchange. You're down a whole rook at this point. But it turns out this position is good for black. So one idea is, uh, so if the queen takes, then we have... Um, <coughs> Bishop takes g4. So in addition to tearing apart the pawn structure, uh, black is getting some material back. And, uh, and if the knight takes, which is the other way of going, then uh, bishop to e6 is, is actually setting up some deadly threats here, threatening the mate. So uh, if we back up now that you see those two threats, um, it may be a little more obvious why this is a good move. This knight here on um, e4, on d4 rather, is guarding the e6 square, so it's preventing the bishop from coming to e6. So that's one idea, and uh, and the other idea is so one idea is to distract the knight, and the other idea is to place the queen on this diagonal where it can be hit by the bishop takes um, bishop takes g4 shot. So pretty interesting tactic. You can you can see it once it's been pointed out. But uh, maybe it's not so easy to find. <laughs> it helps to have someone point it out for you. Okay, so uh, neither side saw that, and Bronstein didn't see it in commentary. So the black player pushed on with b4. And the position is, um, you know, the chess engine rates this position as slightly better for white, but, uh, you know, black is still in the game. It's not, uh, not going either, it's not uh, decisive in either direction. Okay, so after b4... Um, White didn't take right away. He played uh, queen c1 first. He's a little bit concerned, I guess, about uh, pawn takes and uh, queen here, checkmate. Also, the rick coming over. So he wants to uh, trade off the queens. Do you have an option there? H takes g6 actually is given. Yeah, it is possible to play h takes g6, apparently, but uh, you might have to be a computer to see that. Other things uh, look to give an advantage to black, so not too many choices here. Anyway, yeah, bullet. Boleslavsky decides to trade off the queens, so queen to c3, and um, queen to c1. So the queen took on c3, around there, sorry about that, and then uh, queen to b2. So continuing to chase the, the queen around, trying to get rid of the pressure against his king. The rook comes over to c8 to uh, add some fuel to the fire here, and now um, he takes, opening up the g file, and, and this time black decides to trade because um, there's a danger of the queen coming back here. The white's queen can come back here and then go to uh, the h6 square, and that would be a pretty dangerous attack. So black takes off the queen. King takes. And then h takes g6. The h file was open, but uh, with the queens off, black has hopes of surviving this. And um, right here, uh, white makes a mistake. Um, a good way to continue might be just uh, bishop to e2 or... Uh, Let's see, could the bishop go to d3 as well? You lifting it off the back rank, maybe getting the ricks set up over here on the uh, h and g files, or maybe doubling on the h file. Um, he was still trying to resolve, Boleslavsky was still trying to resolve the situation with his b pawn and, uh, you know, his somewhat uh, messed up structure around the king. So he, he tried to uh, fix his problems by playing the move a3. But this move is actually a mistake. And so after this move, the advantage shifts in the game. It went from uh, being favorable to white to being uh, even or maybe favorable to black. So um, well, let's play on one or two moves here. Bishop takes a3, and king takes a3 was played. It's, here's, here's the position where the tactic. So if you want to look for the tactic for black in this position, this one's easier to see. Okay, I'm going to give it away. Once again, the tactic is... Uh, Knight takes f3. And, um, of course, if you take it, which is what was played, you really don't have anything better, the rook comes down here with a check. And now uh, black has won a pawn. So let's stop and count the material. Black is still down the exchange. 
He's got a rook and two minor pieces versus two rooks and a bishop. But he's got a whole bunch of pawns for that, and uh, his position is starting to look pretty good here. Um, the This is a very uh, interesting spot here. There's one way the computer suggests for uh, for white to maintain equality, and uh, one way to lose, <laughs> basically. And uh, so let's set up the decision. You see both of these uh, pawns are under attack from the knight. And um, so it's, uh, they can't both be defended, and uh, they can't both be moved, <laughs> So, uh, which are basically your options. I know great counterattacks. Um, I, I guess you could consider a rook over here to counterattack the... Uh, counterattack the A-pawn maybe is, a, is an idea. But um, the two moves to consider that are uh, uh, suggested by the engine as the top two choices are to push the pawns forward, either one or the other. Um, and the question is, which pawn would you push forward here? So if you want to take some time and think about it, just uh, limiting your, your thoughts to those two moves, uh, pushing one pawn forward or the other, to save it, and you're going to lose the other one. Whichever one you don't push, you're going to lose. Which which pawn would you save, and which pawn would you push ahead? Okay, uh, what Boleslavsky played here was e5, and a very a natural kind of move. You want to uh, kind of break up uh, White's pawns if you can, and uh, and uh, so he's giving up the g pawn, and uh, he's going to take over here with the e pawn. He hopes. Um, the best move, actually, though, is uh, pushing forward with g5. So let's let's put this on the board. If you play this pawn, then the, the knight will grab the other pawn. And then you have the move um, bishop to g2. So you get some material back. Um, and let's see, it's best to uh, defend the knight, I guess. So this exchange... And um, rook, rook to e1, either rook, I think. Yeah, rook h to e1 is suggested. And uh, so this funny setup here, you'll, you'll um, kind of force an exchange, or, uh, or black will have to give up another pawn here. And you have this pawn holding these two, and this pawn over here against uh, these pawns over here. Um, and a rook against a bishop. And uh, this may be a position that you can hold. So instead, you know, I don't, I don't know if uh, that was so easy to see. Instead, uh, Bozlovsky played e5, which I think uh, is a more natural kind of move. Like I said, trying to bust up the center pawn formation that Black has here. Um, and then knight takes. And you have the move bishop e2 here, similar to what we saw in the other case. You can, you can get rid of that uh, knight. Um, and, uh, well, rook f2 was played. Yeah, one difference is that in this square, the uh, the knight is protected by the bishop. So after this exchange, um, the bishop comes back and hits the rook. And so I think, yeah, I think this is where things really go wrong. It's because the bishop hits the rook. So in this line, we have a black has a tempo, which he didn't have in the other line. And when the rook moves, he can grab the pawn. So rook, rook d to uh, f1 was played. Is that right? Rook D. Yeah, yeah. Rook D to F1. Okay, P posing the rook. And there's this exchange. And then uh, black grabs another pawn. So this is a, uh, a really dangerous formation here. We have uh, all of these pawns, plus helped by a bishop, and there's just a lone rook to defend them. And actually, this is a, uh, a winning position for black. So a very, very close uh, call. We saw just that one move with the pawn would change the game from being even to being advantage to black. And, uh, and Geller goes on to win this game. So let's see, he starts by... Okay, it's uh, Boleslavsky's move. Boleslavsky starts by e4. I mean, he does have a passed pawn. He's got to make what use he has of it. So the king comes over to stay within the square of the pawn so it doesn't get out of hand. Uh, the rook comes over to attack the a-pawn. Bishop uh, maneuvers itself. It's doing two jobs here. It's um, staying in the path of the uh, C pawn, and it's getting out of the path of the uh, G pawn here. So, um, yeah, C5 was pushed, and then uh, black starts pushing the G pawn forward. So white goes ahead and grabs the A pawn that was sitting there. 
but the g-pawn is running now. Rick goes to a3 to hit the bishop, freezing the pawn for the moment. Um, the king comes forward to e8, always staying within the square of this pawn, so it uh, doesn't get out of hand. King goes over to c1 to try and help stop some of these pawns if he can. f5 was played. King to, sorry, king to d2. f4. And now it's going to be safe for the bishop to get out of the way and start pushing the g-pawn. Rook to a6 was played to try and get behind the pawns. g3. And uh, king to e1. And bishop to e4. And at this point, uh, Boleslavsky resigned. There's just not going to be any way for him to stop uh, this array of pawns from uh, scoring a touchdown. So uh, that's how the game ended. Let's do a little summary of round 19. Um, like I said, Ryshevsky drew his game, a very lucky escape. Uh, Smyslov drew his game as well. So the uh, top, the tournament leaders are still uh, the top two players. It's uh, Smyslov with 12 points and Ryshevsky with 11 points. And then half a point behind, we have Bronstein with 10 and a half. And at 10 points, we have Nidorf. So the leaderboard is unchanged after 19 rounds. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this. Stay tuned for uh, round 20 coverage. See you then. Bye.